Intersex people face a range of health and human rights issues and deep-seated stigma caught between two contrasting visions of who and how they should be. On the one hand, this includes medical interventions in infancy and childhood that are explicitly intended to make intersex bodies conform to social norms for a specific sex or gender. On the other hand, people with intersex variations increasingly face misgendering through social expectations to identify as a third gender or sex to challenge or transgress gender norms. And people with intersex variations are born with atypical physical sex characteristics, which include genetic, hormonal, and anatomical differences. Dr. Komozo Matabe is a urologist at the Donald Gordon Center. She's here to talk about the stigma surrounding being intersexed, as well as a whole variety of health and mental social issues related to this. Doctor, pleasure to have you back with us once again. Thank you for having me. And uh, we appreciate your time. A very broad subject this. We are going to do our best to work our minds around it. And one person who has brought it to the fore in recent times is the celebrated athlete Casta Semenya. Yes. And uh, I know I'm moving into complicated territory because I've just spoken about intersex and I'm suggesting that a person like Casta Semenya could be such a person. So it's a very confusing subject. Is it fair to already think of Casta Semenya when we are discussing this, for instance? I think, yes, recent events, and I mean recent being the last couple of years, not just the last couple of months, mm -hmm. uh, would, would have all of us thinking that way. Yeah. Um, so intersex, in, in terms of medical, you know, the medical perspective is, is a complex condition. Mm. So from a social perspective, absolutely, if you look at somebody and you can't quite tell, you know, if they're male or female or if they, so we, we speak about um, under, masculinized, uh, under masculinized males, or over-masculinized females. So we can have that, but we can have, you know, so, so the best place to diagnose it is, is at birth. Mm. So we should absolutely be making the diagnosis at birth because if you see a child that's just been born and you can't tell, because it could be that they have a large clitoris or they have a small penis, and sometimes it is difficult to tell. Mm. Um, so we should be making the diagnosis at birth, but some of them will get through those first few years and they are fine without any red flags. And then as they enter puberty is when the red flags start to happen. So um, a child who's been raised as a boy and behaves as a boy and, and hangs out with boys, starts having their periods when they turn 13 or 14. That's a big issue. And I think the problem is, like with many things, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. The medical community is not out there informing the community, so people don't know where to seek help. Mm. Sometimes people don't even know that, you know, this is something for which there is help. And so we really do want them to present to us. So, you know, at birth when they are seen, they should be channeled within, um, you know, the, the correct um, medical facilities or if they're caught later at birth. And the big thing for me being that some of the conditions that can lead this, that can lead to this appearance are potentially lethal. So it's not just the social perspective. Well, what do you mean uh, potentially lethal? So, so one of the things um, that can lead to this is, is, a, is an abnormality of the testes. Yeah. And so that the patients have undescended testes. The testes should be in the scrotum. And if they're not, if, if, if one or both of the testes don't find their way into the scrotum mm. and they remain within the abdomen long term, that can become cancer because the okay. testes are meant to be in a cool environment. Yeah. So that can lead to cancer, which is a potentially lethal event. But even before that, um, one of the conditions that can lead to um, over-masculinized females at birth. So you look at the child and you're quite convinced that it's a girl, but there's certain features that look like they're just over-masculinized is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And if we don't make that diagnosis at birth, that child will die within and a explain, couple of days. And explain that medical term for me. So, so what happens is one of the things that's responsible for, um, for our gender, so it, of course, it's, it's the carrier type, which is the gene. So is mm. it XX or XY? Mm -hmm. So you can have where the, the genes where it's XXY or XXYY, so there may be extra chromosomes. Yeah. So, so that can be where the problem began. So it could be that um, in just the determination of the sex of this child, the ovum from the mother and the sperm from the dad, that there's confusion there. Yes. So that could be where the problem begins. Or it could be that the X and the Y are completely normal. So it's an, it's an XX baby, which is female, or an XY baby who's completely normal at conception, 
but then something happens after conception. So if mom was taking contraceptives mm -hmm. and she's unaware that she's pregnant, so she's taking extra hormones in the form yes. of the contraception. Yes. So that can lead to um, damage to the baby. Okay. Now let's pause for a while because, uh, you know, that is, is very involved, the yes. way you're explaining yes. it. But reading some of the material around this, uh, there's a suggestion that, that we have, there's a continuum of genders, right? Yeah, that's right. But as ordinary people, many of us, we think in so-called binary fashion, yes. either or. Yes. You're either a woman or you're a man. Yeah. But continuum suggests so many differences from yeah. one extreme to the other. Can yeah. you explain this concept to me? Yeah, I think um, we need to be looking at all of life really like that. It's never really either or. Mm. You know, there, there's lots of other alternatives in between. And we just need to be more accepting of people. Excuse me. So one, one of the, um, the controversies around this medical condition is who makes the decision yes. that this child is a boy or a girl? Yeah. And then what interventions are entered into and when are they entered into? So in the past, the medical community would make the decisions and they would do gender reassignment surgery very early on. What we're doing now is that it's got to be multidisciplinary. We can't just have one specialist dealing with this. So it's got to be the gynees, the urologist, the endocrinologist, the psychiatrist, and then the parents. You know, they are critical in this. But 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 uh, let me interrupt you for yes. a second there and look at it from the... Because what I'd said earlier is based on social norms. Yes. Right? That, you know, societies, communities just want things to work one yes. way or another. And yes. that's it. So we can get on with our lives. Yeah. Or, or that's at least the original thought, I think. Absolutely. But... But the more we learn about these things, the more we become aware it's useful, and at the same time, it complicates things. What typically happens in your line of work, right? What is the extent of intersexuality, if I may call it that? Mm. And then I throw in the element of LGBTI, mm. like lesbian, mm. gay, and you know, the, the transgender yeah. issues into the, Are they related in any way? Okay, I will, I will touch on just within the medical community what is happening. So yeah. we're moving away from assigning gender early mm. and doing surgery earlier. Mm. So I've got a patient at the moment who was an intersex baby. She's 14 or 15 now. Mm. And then her mom just sent her to the village in Limpopo and that's where she's grown up. So they did some of the initial work, make sure that nothing was dangerous for her, that there wasn't a lethal condition mm. at play. Mm. And her mom just sent her off to the village and she's lived with her grandmother for the last couple of years. Mm. And she's now at a point where she can make the decision, mm. you know, and therefore we are going to carry on based on her desires. And, and I mean, she, she feels completely female. She is in her mind completely female. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's the way we're going to, so uh, there's a, a big move towards doing that. So we don't start chopping and changing, you know, in, in childhood. So let them decide. Make it as safe as possible for them, and let them decide. But, but here's the thing: way. because uh, now what you have just told me, that, then it tells me that you know there's the there's the if I, the mental side, I suppose, and then there's the the physical. Absolutely. And then of course, when you bring in the broader community, yeah. then the social element. Absolutely. What determines the appropriate gender for anybody? as far as you professionals are concerned, so what, what do you consider? That's where also with the, you know, the lay, um, sorry, the gay, lesbian and transgender, uh, yes. that comes in. So th there's a big role for psychiatrists and psychologists mm. here, because mm. it's not just all just the physical stuff. So mm. it is done in consultation with them. So the multidisciplinary team involves them and involves the patients if they're old enough. And it is literally the decision is made by everybody involved to say, what do we think is best for this child? And, and then whatever decision they make or whatever decision the family makes, that they are supported in carrying out that decision so that mentally they are made strong enough to be able to deal with you know, the ridicule that might come from the community. And, and if, if the decision that's made is, is not well supported, if, they find, if the family finds that it's difficult to live out the decision that they made within the community, they always reconsult with a, with a psychiatrist. So it's a very fluid thing. It's not a decision is made and, you know, we'll see the child when she's 18. So there's constant consultation. But, but, but you know, I mean, at what point would parents get a sense that they need to consult with professionals? Is it something that is obvious at infancy? 
during pregnancy or during puberty or whatever stage of development? Yeah, so point? it can be at any point. So, I mean, the ones that are obvious, you know, when they are born, it's mm. obvious and you, mm. you can't tell. You can't tell whether this is boy or girl. It, it does happen. It, right? it, it certainly and, does happen. And, and, and what is the incidence of that in percentage terms? I'm of not what sure what our, what our numbers are in South Africa. All the numbers that we have, you know, we're not doing our own research. Sure. All the numbers that we have are all the international okay. uh, numbers. So it's, it's not very common, but it certainly does happen. It's not that because you know how it is. You know, in our communities, other people may yeah. uh, blame it on witchcraft Absolutely. or any kind Absolutely. of, uh, you know. One of the things that's contributing to that, because there is an increasing incidence. There is? There is an increasing incidence. Yeah. And part of that, so um, there's a study that the Department of Andrology at Steve Biko is doing. Yes up in Limpopo, where they are looking at environmental factors that might be causing this increase. And what they're finding up in Limpopo is that um, the DDT, which is used to spray for malaria, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of environmental factors, mm. and the DDT is one of them that's doing mm. that. But they're looking at what's in our water. I mean, right now, um, you know, oral contraceptives that women are taking mm -hmm. are ending up in our urine, and that's ending up in the water. Okay. So we're all drinking oral contraceptives currently. You know, so Doctor, how well are we filtering our water? So Doctor, say, <laughs> you know, easier way to <laughs> sort of <laughs> just cope with it. And it ends up in the water and it ends right, up in so our body. So it, it's happy. So, so those are some of the big topics that need to be happening. So we shouldn't be in denial, right? No, we should not okay, be. Okay, all right. <laughs> Live with it. Well, Tawastro. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, and, and also the assessment of these children when they're older in terms of the psych psychiatric mm. assessment, mm. because we need to determine, is it that, you know, this person is just a boy who likes to dress as a girl, or is there something in their genes that is female? Um, or is this person actually gay? Is it that it's the sexual interest which is in male? So there's a lot of fine little boxes that need to be ticked to try and figure out what exactly are we dealing with. Okay, let's look at this from the person who may be intersexed but does not know how to deal mm. with themselves typically what happens with the, with such a person and, and then tell me from a parent's point of view and then we'll move to the social community sure. point of view about this matter let's start sure. with the individual sure with the individual i think they they, they will know you know, somewhere along the line because mm. of conversations that they've had with their parents or, you know, when children grow up, they're mixing with other children, bathing with other children, mm. swimming with other children. You're going to notice that something about you is different. Mm. Um, and I think the thing is all, all children are different. All people are different. And it is about how we help them to accept that. But certainly they, they are going to know. And yes. if, if parents um, are in denial... Um, or if parents are choosing to not listen to their children, that's a whole different story. But I think there's going to be red flags, and mm. somebody who is attentive to their child will know, and the child mm. themselves is going to pick up that something is not exactly 100%, you mm. know. But so some of them, it might just be that they don't see anything wrong. Yes. They feel completely as one gender, and they're comfortable as their gender, but perhaps the external appearance might lead to confusion. Yeah. And those that don't, you know, in childhood, then, then it's certainly puberty. Puberty is where things start to happen or where things don't happen. Mm. So if we're expecting everybody, you know, every female child should have started their periods by the time they're about 16, mm. latest. I mean, it's mm. starting earlier and mm. earlier. So a 16-year-old female who has not started their periods, we need to look. There might be more going on mm. than just delayed, mm. delayed, um, you know, delayed periods. Mm. So we look for secondary um, sexual characteristics, right. you know, the beard, the deepening of the voice, breast development. And so if those things happen in somebody that we don't expect that they should happen or they don't happen when we expect them to mm. happen, that's a red flag. Okay. Yeah. Now, and for parents, right? Yeah. Now, for the communities... Society, how should we understand this? You know, if just as a way of getting us to support, yeah. if we can, or at least accept yeah. the yeah. people who may be different from ourselves. Yeah. You know, I think that comes in in all the other things. In terms of race, you know, how do we accept people who look different from us? Mm. How, so I think, I think that's not a medical issue. That's mm. really, you know, within the bigger social picture, just accept people for who they are. Yeah. You know, they're not you, you yes. know, and just get on with your life. You know, so I think it's, it's for the for the families they need to engage with with um, uh, health professionals. Yeah. But for for the community, you know, well, look but at you your know there business. are there's cultural things, there's also religious and so on. As yeah. you know, there's this American 
uh, pastor who was meant to come to South Africa has been denied entry, a controversial matter. But there are many other cultural things, rituals, practices yeah. that complicate the story. Yeah. So I, I, I really think that that's where if we are making strong families, strong individuals, strong families, you can just manage their own business. You know, I must manage myself and my child. What you do with your child is your business, you know, and I really, I, I should not be commenting on what you, how you bring up your children. Um, so I really think this is a matter where people's privacy needs to be respected, you know, just, just like we're doing with AIDS. And I don't go around telling people like, you know, if, if you're diabetic, you must go around and tell everybody that you're diabetic. Mm. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. And we really just need to learn to respect each other. And, and that's, that's my point on the social so community. So if aspect. there's one particular takeaway for either the individual or the parent or the society, what would it be when it comes to this matter? If there's any confusion, seek medical help. Because if it's something serious, then we will deal with the seriousness of it. And if it's not a potentially lethal thing, then we provide the environment to just help everybody deal with the situation. So it is, it is seek help. It's, it's always better to know. It's always better to know. Denial doesn't get us anywhere. So seek help, ask the questions, and then you decide what you're going to do with it afterwards. You know, are you going to continue to live in this body? Do you want surgery? Do you want, you know, hormones? What is it that you want? But it's, you know, it, you can only make that decision when you know, when you know what's going on. Doctor, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Sir. And uh, we learned a lot from you tonight. We appreciate it.